In this installment of the Jewels of Quakerism series, we'll be looking at discernment and spiritual practices. We'll ask the question, what is discernment and what do friends mean when they talk about coming to unity? We'll look at the corporate and individual spiritual practice of Quakers and how they use different practices to deepen their spirituality, both in the meeting itself and as individuals. So the place to start out today is with this word discernment. And discernment has uh, its use in standard English and its somewhat uh, specialized use in the jargon of Quakers. So discernment as a word comes from dis and then cernere or ternere in the Latin. And so the dis means away from and ternere means to sift or to use a, a, a sieve. So it means to sift away. Uh, scripturally, we see in the Gospel of Matthew, there's this um, proclamation by John the Baptist who says that, um, you know, he who comes after me will learn how to and be able to um, separate the wheat from the chaff. That kind of idea of moving some things away and being left with which that is nourishing, right? So the wheat and the chaff is, is the wheat kernel and then it's covered by the thing that's the shell, the chaff, we don't need that, let's leave ourselves with the nourishing piece. And so that's, that's kind of the idea of discernment, that we sift through it and we're left with these kind of the nuggets of, of wisdom and truth that will inspire us to move forward. And so discernment is part of lots of different religious traditions, certainly lots of different Christian traditions. The idea is how do we know how to live our lives the fullest and the most faithfully we can? And the way we figure out what those choices are is through a process called discernment. And friends have some particular practices, some particular spiritual practices to practice discernment. So one of the things that's kind of interesting about Friends is that, as we've mentioned several other times in the series, what they came to, the practices they had, the things that they did, the reason they did them, did not kind of poof out of air. They're certainly done in reaction to other things and certainly are kind of uh, at least logically traceable and tractable from some of the other things that were going on at the time. So discernment as a spiritual practice was absolutely part of the Christian kind of milieu. So the issue, though, was that oftentimes discernment was most fully practiced only by those who ordained. So, for example, even to this day in 2009, generally it's believed, at least theologically, that certain people have the capacity to understand the will of God. The Pope, for example, in the Catholic tradition, is understood to be infallible, that the Pope knows the will of God. So theologically there was a precedent for friends. But what they said and what was radical about what friends believed is that the will of God, what was wanted for the people of Israel, for Christians to inherit the earth, the kingdom of God, to usher in the peaceable kingdom, that those steps needed to get to that place could be figured out by a group of lay people, people who had not been ordained in the Catholic church or in the Anglican church. It was possible for all people who were willing to kind of be still and silent and listen for that still small voice and hear what it was that they were being led to do. We talked in a previous video about leadings, and this is the idea, that we can discern the steps needed to be on our faithful path. And that discerning, that figuring out how to do that, is a corporate practice, generally speaking, for friends. Friends gather together and in asking each other questions and sitting in silent prayer and waiting to see what emerges among the body of folks gathered, people can come to clearness. They will become clear of the path before them. And it might not always be what they thought they was going to do. It's not the same thing as giving someone advice, but through that silent prayerful practice of worshiping and querying each other and asking questions, people can draw out the wheat from the chaff and be left with this kind of the this beautiful piece of nourishing uh, decision that helps the body go forward or helps an individual become clear on what the next step should be. Probably the most common um, practice of corporate discernment in which friends engage is the meeting for worship with attention to business. And in the meeting for worship with, with attention to business, friends are engaged in a process of corporate discernment in the hopes of coming to unity. Um, unity 
is not unanimity and it is not consensus decision making. And these three concepts sometimes get confused. People in secular settings often talk about using Quaker style consensus or Quaker consensus decision making. And certainly many groups have adapted a Quaker spirit led coming to unity process for a secular setting and that's great. But in the meeting for worship, we are sitting in worship and we're coming to unity in the spirit. Not a unanimity of ideas, but a united movement in the spirit towards truth. Um, friends talk about coming to a sense of the meeting and a sense of the meeting may be a unified decision that we're supposed to move forward on a particular action or with a particular nominating slate. It also may be the sense that we are not able to make a decision at this time, that we are unclear and that we are wrestling and that our sense of the meeting is that we're supposed to wait. And I think that's a very unique piece of friends decision making process is this willingness to continue to wait until we are clear in the spirit about what we are supposed to do. So one of the things that's really important is that the discernment that happens in a meeting for business is again not magical. It's not some kind of soothsaying or future telling with a crystal ball. It's, it's grounded in experience and pragmatism. And a couple uh, videos ago we were talking about the testimonies and one of the things that's important to remember is that discernment or revelation or kind of guidance from the inner teacher must be tempered. And it's tempered with reason on the one side and human authority and human systems on the other. So it's not as if we're getting kind of pure direction in the world. That might sometimes happen, but often what the meeting for business is, is a place kind of of forging, a forging of, of human will and authority and of human reason and divine guidance. And together, communally, those things are tempered into a steel that is stronger than any one of those things by itself. And in that vein, there's something called the, the threshing session or the threshing meeting. And those often precede a meeting for business. And what happens is people speak a little bit more from a willful and a reasoning space. And they have a conversation, they exchange information, they share viewpoints. It's a little bit more talkative than a meeting for worship usually is. But it helps everyone get onto the same page informationally. And then when everyone in their human kind of reasoning states has some more information and understands different sides of the equation, then later on, maybe later that week or later that month, they can move into a meeting for worship with a concern for business, fully equipped with all the reason and the authorial stances, and then worship and pray together as a body and hope together that there will be some unity that's reached, having divine wisdom being tempered with reason and authority. So the threshing session precedes the meeting for business and it helps us in our reason kind of get onto the same page. So the main technology or vehicle for discernment in a friends meeting is the meeting for worship with a concern for blank. So the meeting for worship, which is the standard worship service that most folks are familiar with, it usually happens sometimes on a, on a Sunday morning or sometimes in a Sunday afternoon. People gather for, generally speaking, an hour of silent worship and prayer. Um, can sometimes be kind of retrofitted for a purpose. And when that happens, it's referred to as a meeting for worship with a concern for uh, business or a concern for marriage or memorial. Um, and those, um, those meetings are often shortcutted to be called a business meeting or a meeting for marriage or a meeting for memorial. And really that meeting for memorial is a shortcut to a meeting for worship with a concern for the memorial or an attention to memorial. So those are just um, shorter versions of the longer thing. And it's actually really important to keep that in mind because even our business meetings, our marriage meetings, our memorial meetings should be grounded in that spirit of worship because what we're trying to do is discern the way forward. So if there's a business meeting, even if it's something as small and trivial as the color of a rug, uh, it's really important 
that um, we're trying to listen to the will of God. And recently we heard some friends at New York Yearly Meeting raise this up a couple times and think it's worth mentioning. God doesn't care about the color of the rug that we choose. God cares about the way in which we come to the decision about which color rug to choose. And I like that. I mean, obviously there's this issue of the, you know, the willful God there, but, but there's this beautiful metaphor that what matters is the means and the ends of the consistency. It has to be all together. We should come into our decisions together as a body in a prayerful, worshipful space so that it's not people just making rational decisions and kind of clocking other people aside the head if they disagree. It's together coming to this slow and steady orientation that shows us that uh, the way forward is, is this way or that way. And in that space, we discern our way forward. So the meeting for business, uh, the meeting for worship with an attention to business, happens usually once a month, hence the monthly meeting. They gather and they consider the business of the monthly meeting. Um, the meeting for worship with an attention to healing, some meetings do, some don't, but it's where prayer lists are considered and people pray over and for uh, people in the meeting. The meeting for worship with an attention to marriage is the celebration and the worship surrounding the union of two folks in the meeting. And the memorial meeting is the friends a kind of equivalent of a funeral service. Again, it's a fully generally open, unprogrammed, traditionally meeting for worship and people carry on their hearts the lives of the person who has died and then messages rise for the sake of consolation or whatever it is that's supposed to rise for the body at that time. In addition to the meeting for worship with attention to business, memorial, marriage, we want to lift up some other spiritual practices that Quakers engage in corporately and talk a little bit about those. The first one is the practice of worship sharing. It's also sometimes called worship fellowship. And in the practice of worship sharing, it's a time for friends to gather in silent waiting, usually around a query about our individual spiritual life and spiritual growth and to share in a, um, in a small meeting for worship, in a space of confidence, and in a space of deep listening, what's true for us at that moment. It's an opportunity to share our condition in the spirit with others who are listening to us in prayer. It's a practice that's engaged in um, not to reach a decision, but just to hear each other and to know each other in that which is eternal together. It's a deeply um, intimate and tender practice in which the, the listening sometimes listens the truth out of people that they may not have known that they have been holding on to. And in worship sharing, the bar isn't set quite so high as we might set it in a meeting for worship around um, the needing to be impelled out of your seat to speak. Friends are encouraged to share from the place of spirit and to experiment a little and just share what's on their hearts. It, it's not as if they're offering vocal ministry or a prophetic speech. They're really sharing what's true for them in that moment with others who are gathered in prayer and fellowship. Additional spiritual practices that friends engage in corporately include the writing of epistles and minutes and sharing those with each other. Usually a gathered body, whether it's a yearly meeting or another gathering, will conclude their session by writing an epistle, a letter, think of Paul's epistles in the New Testament, a letter to friends everywhere sharing the news of their time that was spent together in the Spirit. It's not a letter that says we did this and this and this and this and this, rather a letter that might include some of the things that happened, but also how was the body moved? What questions did we wrestle with together? And what new truths emerged that we want to share with each other because we're excited about them and we want to know how spirit is moving with other friends on this issue as well. In addition to the epistle, there are also the minutes that we write that grow out of our meeting for worship with attention to business. The minutes will capture what happened and um, the unity that friends came to while they were together in worship. This is uh, important historically. It's also important contemporarily when we gather again to know where we were the last time so that we can continue on from there. 
Minutes may also talk about which particular friends from meeting are going to carry a piece of business forward. Minutes became legal documents. And this can be seen in the meeting for worship with attention to marriage. The marriage certificate, which is commonly um, signed at a meeting for worship with attention to marriage and hung on the wall of friends, is in fact a minute that records what happened at that meeting with an attention to marriage. It's, it's a meeting for business. The focus is on the marriage. The minute records that these two friends came together before God and their community and pledged themselves to each other. And um, there are many states in which there's an exemption for friends. They don't need to have a traditional marriage license. The marriage certificate suffices as that legal document. Another way that friends communicate with each other with letters are letters of introduction and letters of travel. A letter of introduction may accompany a friend who is visiting another meeting for a single visit or um, sojourning in an area and expects to stay for a prolonged time. It's greetings that are carried from one meeting to another and usually a commendation of the friend to the loving care of the meeting that's being visited. It's a way for friends to communicate and to um, endorse the friend. In, uh, historically, a letter of introduction was an important document because a traveling friend might visit and um, show up on the doorstep and need to be hosted by friends of another meeting. The letter of introduction was, in fact, the way that friends knew that this person was a bona fide member of another meeting and, and not just someone who was showing up on their doorstep. Similarly, the letter of travel it serves a very similar function in that way to the letter of introduction. Additionally, the letter of travel includes the concern under which a friend is traveling with a concern for the end of slavery, say in the case of John Woman, and states that the meeting has met in worship and discerned that this friend's concern is rightly ordered and that the meeting looks forward to hearing how the spirit is moving among friends as they sit together in worship with um, attention to the concern whether it's traveling in the gospel ministry or under a particular social concern how is spirit moving commonly a letter of travel has a has a page for endorsement apart for the friends who are being visited to offer their experience to the home meeting of the friend who has visited them. This serves as a kind of accountability and also an additional way for friends to communicate to each other what truth has emerged and how this friend is serving the spirit um, so that friends at home can know what happens when this friend is traveling with their endorsement. In the vein of corporate practices of uh, friends, one of the things that's certainly relevant is the way that friends did Bible study. Now, not all folks do this, and it's certainly not super common among the liberal meetings. However, the conservative meetings tend to keep this tradition in uh, practice, and there are some meetings that are other places that do practice it. And that is kind of a group practice of what's known as the Catholic Lectio Divina. Uh, they kind of were discovered in parallel paths and what it looks like is a meeting for worship again that base technology of Quakerism and someone will open up the scriptures to the page that they're supposed to open it up to and the way they know it's the page they're supposed to open it up to it's because it's the page they open up to and then they'll read the scripture they're supposed to read using a similar technique and then the body will in worshipful silence kind of sit and then they will offer reflections on how it is that scripture speaks to them and this is a kind of an interesting insight into Quaker theology, that the scripture, as Robert Barclay says, the scripture is the fountain, and it should not be confused with the source. So the scriptures absolutely point the way into the living waters, but the scripture can't be confused as an equivalence with God. And as a result, since there is that of God in each of us, scriptures will speak to each of us of the power and light of life in different ways. And so as we experience the scripture and it's opened up to us in different ways, as we share with one another in that gathered silent worship, suddenly the scriptures will be revealed and more clear to everyone gathered in that circle in a way that it wouldn't have been 
than if we were by ourselves in our room with a Bible cracked open. So this corporate experience of reading and interpreting scripture is something that is a, a, another kind of jewel of Quakerism that is maintained by the conservative friends and is starting to reemerge in bits and pockets and other folks um, throughout North America. And perhaps in addition, many meetings practice the reading of what are called the advices and queries. Advices and queries might be found in the Book of Christian Discipline, also called the Book of Faith and Practice, that yearly meetings produce to talk about that yearly meeting's understanding of the, the Religious Society of Friends, its history, its practice, and um, includes advices and queries for meetings to consider on a regular basis. The advices may be about many subjects from what we would call the friends' testimonies about simplicity, integrity, and community, to um, our readiness and, and regular preparation for the meeting for worship, to the care of children in first day school. And um, meetings treat them very differently. Uh, some liberal friends' meetings will read the advices and then ask the queries, at the beginning of their monthly meeting for worship with attention to business and leave an open space for friends to answer from worship to the condition of the meeting. So our um, advices and queries on the spiritual life of our children, a query might be, are we taking time to include children in regular spiritual activities throughout the week in our lives? And in that way, the queries serve as a kind of accountability for the meeting to consider how it's growing in the spirit. How are we tending to our young ones? How are we tending to the old ones and people who are isolated at home? And a reminder to be paying attention to the entirety of community and reflecting on our own spiritual practices and, and seeing the areas of spiritual growth and maybe some places that we need to be tending to. Another practice that many friends meetings, both programmed friends meetings and increasingly unprogrammed friends meetings engage in is music and song, refreshment in music and singing, making a joyful noise unto the Lord. Uh, in a programmed or a semi-programmed meeting for worship, hymns are regularly incorporated in the first day service. In many, in many unprogrammed friends meetings, friends are meeting once or twice a month, maybe even weekly before meeting or staying after to sing hymns or sing from the Rise Up Singing Book or the Quaker Hymnal, and to share time together in, in music and in the spirit of music. And that certainly is an important corporate spiritual practice, lifting up their voices to, to, with each other and to God. Having looked at some of the corporate practices that friends do gathered as a body or in small groups, it's useful to turn our attention to the way that friends individually kind of deepen their spiritual lives. It's worth noting also that to some degree, at least from our perception, there aren't really any uh, indigenous individual practices within the traditional uh, religious society of friends. There were certainly things that people did, reading scripture and praying, uh, that were part of it. But in terms of a formalized practice, the way that some other denominations have, such as praying the rosary or doing Lectio Divina, traditionally that was not, as far as we can tell, part of what Quaker practice was. The emphasis on community was so large that much of the work that they did was done in groups. However, owing to lots of factors, there are many practices that friends are beginning to do today. And so we thought we would lift up some of those. Uh, chief among those that we want to mention is one of the few that we know is a traditional practice, and that is journaling. Many of the Quaker ministers, and some at least a couple of the elders, kept journals as they traveled in their ministry. And sometimes even when people were not traveling in ministry, they would keep a spiritual journal to talk about how the, the Spirit was working and moving in their lives, and whether they were being faithful and yielding to it, or whether they were being kind of hard, hard-hearted and obstinate about it. So these kinds of uh, journaling activities were things that friends would do on an individual basis. And friends continue to journal, and it's a spiritual practice that some folks have. Perhaps reading some scripture, and then writing about how it reflects on you, or reflecting on your day, talking about some of the lessons you learned or some of the hopes you have for the future. Journaling is a practice. And in these days, 2009, some of the things that are starting to emerge, especially over the past five years or so, has been the presence of online 
blogging, which is web logging, shortened to blogging. And these are websites that are kind of like web journals where friends are reflecting on different aspects, sometimes thematically, sometimes on a daily basis, like the older Quaker journals have been. And one of the great resources for that is a website called QuakerQuaker.org. And, and you can go there and read all sorts of blogs from all different kinds of friends from all sorts of places in the United States and to some degree also the some in Africa and some in the UK. And so access to these kinds of um, readings can then become one's own spiritual practices. Taking the time to reading to read other people's journals can then become an uh, individual spiritual practice for ourselves. And given to the low cost um, of making a blog, if you have internet access, it's a practice that people can do so that other folks can kind of reflect and read what it is that you're thinking about, what you're writing about, and what you're processing. So from the Quaker tradition of journaling, we've had this outgrowth of thing called the Quaker uh, blogging, which is a growing practice practice among friends. Our individual practice is a kind of a modification of the one we talked about earlier with the advices and queries. Uh, many friends take the advices and queries and they sit with them themselves. I have some advices and queries that I post kind of near my bedroom and so on my way into bed or out of my bed I can read them and it's a reminder. It's a continual set of questions that I ask myself to kind of help guide me in, in my practices. So using the advices and queries individually or kind of in your home is often an individual practice that people use. Sometimes folks um, use a single query. For example, when we were teaching class yesterday someone said that they lifted up the um, question, was he faithful and did the yield? So that question of being faithful and yielding to kind of the leadings of the spirit, that by themselves they put on the dashboard of their car or they hang it above their desk or their computer. And so it's just one set of questions. Were you faithful and are you yielding? And over and over again it begins to kind of almost become um, what in the Eastern traditions is called a mantra. It's this question you ask yourself and it helps to guide your practice throughout the day. So the, the questioning, the use of advice and queries is also an individual practice that some folks use. We don't want to leave out a really important individual spiritual practice for friends, which is prayer and meditation. Time for regular connection with the spirit in preparation for the corporate worship that happens each first day. There are several, many kinds of, of prayer and meditation. And again, we said there aren't really indigenous forms of prayer in Quakerism, so we're going to lift up a few of the forms of Christian prayer that may be useful for friends in their individual practice. The first is uh, simply a prayer of thanksgiving, of gratitude. And many friends find it important to practice regular thanksgiving at the beginning and the end of the day for this day that the Lord has made. In addition, there's intercessory prayer or petitionary prayer, praying on behalf of another who may be sick or in need and petitionary prayer, which is pray for oneself, sometimes for guidance, sometimes for an answer to a specific question. There's contemplative prayer, which is often referred to as centering prayer. The writer Thomas Keating writes a lot about centering prayer, and many friends find that practice of silent deepening to be very fruitful for them during the week and um, prepare them for the meeting for worship. Lectio Divina, the practice of reading scripture that friends do in corporate, can also be done on one's own. And there's a writer, Thelma Hall, who wrote a book, Too Deep for Words, which is an excellent outline of how one might engage in Lectio Divina individually and to let the words of scripture pray through us as individuals and open up the scripture in new ways. So to close, it's worth trying to kind of tie it all together and understand the overarching theme here. The name of this episode is Discernment and Spiritual Practices. And so while all of these corporate and spiritual practices might help the individual deepen their faith life or be more faithful kind of generically, it's our understanding that in a particular way, what's helping, what's happening is that they're developing their ability to discern more fully. If, in fact, discernment is that practice of feeling after God, that intuitive listening for that which comes from the source rather than from another perhaps very worthy place but not from the spirit, every time we engage in a spiritual practice corporately or as individuals, 
we become more intimate with that source and so more able to recognize it when we when it's apparent and abundant and there. One of the ways that we like to describe this kind of metaphorically is with an artist. If you ask an artist who's painted kind of a, uh, an amazing painting, you know, how did you make this? They can tell you all the steps they took to get there, but that doesn't mean that you will be able to kind of reproduce a piece of art. So there's this um, connoisseurship that happens. If you practice the skills of drawing the lines and painting the brushes and then follow your intuition and kind of allow the creative forces to kind of come to fruition, then what will happen is you'll slowly be able to kind of work at your craft. So discernment is not a kind of a checklist thing. It's not about flow charts and figuring out the exact right thing for every situation. It's an artistic craft that you practice and practice and practice and you kind of come to understand and feel. And the things that we've addressed in this video are both practices that discernment is used in and practices that help us to use discernment better. Maybe a final a kind of um, a, perhaps another apocryphal way of explaining it was something that the assistant clerk of New York Yearly Meeting lifted up in, in her um, introduction to the meeting for discernment that the New York Yearly Meeting was engaging in. And she shared that someone asked Michelangelo how it was that he created David. And his answer was, that's easy. I just removed everything that was not David. So discernment is the sifting through and removal mm -hmm. of the things that don't need to be there. And hopefully some of these practices have been useful and clarifying. And it's our hope that as folks consider these videos, that they proceed in their lives and they grow more skillful and more faithful in their ability to discern uh, way forward for themselves and their community.